welcome to SAL 3. Our next talk is called Reverse Engineering uh, Display Link Devices. It's about um, Linux support for USB graphic adapters and it's going to be held by Florian Echtler. I'm very excited to hear about that, so please give a round of applause to the speaker. Okay, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, yeah, my name is Florian Echter, and I'd like to tell you a bit about what Chris Hodges and I have done in order to be able to use Display Link graphics cards on Linux and other open operating systems. So, um, at first, I'd like to introduce you to Display Link devices if you haven't seen them already. They're actually quite useful. They're USB graphic cards. Uh, quite cheap, around maybe 50 euros. They have DVI output or HDMI if you want. Um, and in contrast to other USB graphic cards which you could buy earlier, they use actually do use compression in order to, to get more bandwidth out of the USB bus. Um, and they don't offer any sort of open source drivers or Linux drivers. If you ask, of course, you get something like, uh, yeah, we're working on it, but then you don't hear anything else. Um, so we uh, decided to just look how these things work and uh, installed the Windows driver in a virtual machine uh, on Windows XP and attached the device and listened with uh, USB mon on the host computer. Um, unfortunately, as you might see from this excerpt somewhere from the dump, it's pretty much encrypted, so this is supposed to be just black, black, a black screen. And yeah, uh, it's, it's safe to conclude that this is some, some kind of encryption. Of course, this uh, begs the question why they do use encryption at all, but this is for, uh, for a different part, probably. Okay, so we were a bit surprised to see this and then uh, thought about what to do next. So, of course, we um, cracked the device open and had a look inside and found exactly three chips one really, really big ASIC, with, which you can probably see here if you look hard enough, um, and besides, which is this one, and besides just a DVI encoder and uh, DDR RAM. So um, we hadn't, didn't have the equipment to sniff any of the data going over the bus here, um, and we uh, didn't have any tech to look inside the, the uh, ASIC itself, so tough luck. We had to use some different method. Um, okay, so we had to try to crack the encryption in some way, and I'll try to tell you a bit about how, how we did this. The first idea is pretty simple. We just took the log, uh, wrote a Python script to uh, dump this to the device again, and what we did this with uh, the first initialization sequence, and what we got was a static Windows desktop image. So this already um, allowed us some conclusions. As the log worked on different devices, it looked that the encryption wasn't hardware dependent in any way. So uh, crack one device and you have, you, you've cracked all of them, uh, which is, of course, a bonus. Um, when you look at the data, yeah, when you look at the data uh, which is sent to the device, then you have some small blocks uh, around maybe at most four kilobytes, and we have two very big blocks. And these blocks have to be sent in the correct sequence, otherwise the device sh starts flashing wildly and crashes. Um, and this, uh, again, allows the conclusion that maybe a stream cipher is used here. So um, we just have a key which has a certain length, and data is always XORed with that key. Uh, and if you reach the end of it, then you just take the length modulus, the length of the key, and start again. Um, we inserted some delays between uh, the blocks, and this, therefore we saw that the first one of the two big blocks just clears the frame buffer, and the second block transfers the desktop contents. So um, this was pretty much where we, where we were at that point. Um, one interesting part was that all, all of this were in, uh, 
uh, in fact, USB bulk transfers. So everything the device does is bulk transfer, with one small exception, which, which is at the very start, when you initialize the device, then some control transfers happen which are not encrypted. So for example, what you get here is the readout of the monitor description. Um, here, four, 64 bytes are read twice and three bytes additionally, so you get a total of 131 bytes. This is uh, the EDID block plus three length bytes, and uh, this is exactly the EDID data of the attached monitor. So at this point, uh, encryption doesn't yet happen. And there's one interesting uh, control transfer in this entire initialization sequence, which is just 16 bytes of seemingly garbage. Um, what's most interesting is these uh, repeat after each device initialization, but um, sometimes after you restart the virtual machine, the same bytes occur again. So uh, again, we started thinking that this might be a crypto key, and so here were some sample sequences which look pretty random. Now, Chris had a really good idea, and we just entered those into Google. Why not? <laughs> and <laughs> And as, as you might already think, we actually got hits. And this was quite surprising at first, but after some reading, we found out that this is simply standard output from the standard Microsoft random number generator. So, um, <laughs> of course, this also explains why you sometimes see it again after you restart the VM, because the system is exactly in the same state as during the last boot. Um, for some additional uh, information on this, you can, you can read the link afterwards. Uh, but okay, so we were pretty certain at that point that this data is actually the crypto key. Um, but of course, this didn't help very much at that point because we still didn't know what the algorithm used for the encryption actually was. Um, so we tried some very basic crypt analysis, which is just to compare the crypto text with itself shifted by a certain length. So you take some buffer of crypto data and uh, for half of the length of these, uh, this buffer, you just compare byte in location one to byte in location uh, one plus some certain offset. And if these bytes are equal, then you increase a counter. And uh, the results were quite convincing. So you can see the, them here. So these are actually sorted by count. Um, so it's pretty certain to say that the key length is uh, 4,095 because this is the maximum and all of the, the multiples of this. Um, and this is, of course, uh, 2 to the 12th power minus 1, as most of you might see, already have seen. And uh, this points, again, to a specific kind of pseudo-random number generator, which is called linear feedback shift register. And this is also interesting because uh, these registers are often used in FPGA and, and ASIC programming because they are very fast, and so this might have been a convenient choice for the, um, for the developers of this device. Um, of course, this doesn't help too much if you know the key length. Um, now, what you need in the end is uh, the key stream generator. So our two assumptions were that we have a stream cipher, we have uh, LFSR, uh, random number generator, a, ma a maximal LFSR, which means that it actually uses the entire, the maximum possible period, so which is 4,095 bytes. Okay, so now we had to try and find the keystream generator in some way, and we started with uh, IDA Pro freeware to just disassemble the driver module, um, and we quickly found that it uses libusb internally, which was statically linked into the driver, which might raise some interesting licensing questions. And um, yeah, the data was just submitted through one of the libusb calls, and what we tried at first was to walk backwards from there, look at the call graph, and look where the data actually comes come from. Uh, unfortunately, the driver was written in C++, and it's not that funny to try to disassemble virtual functions. Um, 
in the end, we settled on a much simpler approach here, and we just looked for in the assembler code for an immediate value of 4,095 because at some point the routine has to to generate that much data, and we quickly found such a subroutine which consisted of three nested loops and which actually does contain uh, that does generate. 4,095 bytes of data, and most interestingly, it, it contains a test against this value. And uh, when you check, for example, Wikipedia on LFSRs, uh, you always need a generator polynome, and only certain ones of these generator polynomes are actually uh, generating a maximal LFSR. Well, and this one is one of them, so we were pretty certain at that point that we had found the key, uh, key stream generator. Sorry. Okay, so one other interesting question is where the 16-byte key, which we found pretty much in the beginning, fits in, because the key stream generated by this LFSR is actually always the same. It just, it just starts with uh, some initial value, which is hard-coded in the data and generates 4,095 bytes of data. Actually, it generates 11 times this amount for, in order to be able to use the buffer more efficiently, so you don't always have to wrap around. But uh, in any case, the random number doesn't, ha hasn't been used up to this point. So what we at first were a bit uh, surprised is that the LFSR data also generates a reverse mapping table, with, which gives you um, the offset for each value, for each random number, basically. And so the starting offset at which the encryption uh, begins is taken from this reverse mapping table. And the index for this table, again, is generated from the key. So the key simply tells you where to start in the actual key stream. And this is also obviously how the device itself works then. Um, the the CRC of this key is just fed into the LFSR on the device, which then starts generating the same key stream as in the, uh, in the driver. So this is, in fact, a standard CRC12, and uh, it looks like the device doesn't even generate the data, uh, doesn't even generate the entire key in memory, but just always pulls a single value from the shift register and then advances it by one. Okay, so one in interesting piece is, of course, that uh, LFSRs which are loaded with zero will always output zero. So uh, if you have a zero C12 or zero, this should just disable the encryption uh, entirely. Um, for some reason, which we haven't been able to figure out yet, uh, it doesn't work with every key, but there are some keys which do have a CRC12 of zero and which do disable the encryption, and we found these in the driver, basically. Uh, most importantly, they are in the driver because the driver has a debug flag which just turns off the entire encryption if you set it to one. So, in fact, we might have found this earlier, but it's still funny to, to know to be able to decrypt the earlier captured data. So, <laughs> Okay, so at this point, we were now able to capture unencrypted uh, communication between the device and the and, uh, Windows driver. And so we were now able to start uh, having a look at the graphics protocol. The protocol itself is in fact quite simple, I won't go into much detail here, so the most important command is just uh, this graphics command, this is more or less the base value, and you have two flags which can be added, and you have uh, three sub-commands. Uh, most important are these two basically, uh, the device internally is organized in two separate frame buffers, so you have a 16-bit frame buffer which is used in 16-bit uh, color depth and in 24-bit color depth. And when you use 24-bit color depth, you get a secondary 8-bit frame buffer, which delivers the missing 8 bits of color data. Yeah, and you can, uh, you have basically just linear memory in the device, 16 megabytes. You can do copy on device. You can write data in a certain R RLE run length encoded um, 
we are not too uh, efficient in coding, but this is, for example, used by the driver to clear the frame buffer. So um, for, for big runs of, of similar colors, this is quite efficient, in fact. And you can, of course, just write raw data to the device. And every one of these commands is followed by a three-byte address and one-byte pixel count. This is, in fact, quite important. This is not the count of bytes which follow, but it's the count of pixels which are in the end written to the frame buffer. So for example, for the run length encoding, you get a much higher pixel count than, uh, which is, than what's actually following in terms of data. Okay, there are also some auxiliary commands. You have uh, a number of registers which, uh, for example, to determine where the frame buffer starts. So you can do um, vertical scrolling by just setting a frame buffer offset. Um, most of these values we have just taken from what the Windows driver sends to enable standard video modes. So these are the blanking, offset, and so on values. Um, there's a flush buffer command, which causes probably all uh, queued commands to be executed. And there's one very important command, which, which sets the Huffman uh, encryption table. Yeah, as I said, if you're interested in more details, please see the references. Uh, Otherwise, I think it would be pretty boring. Now I'll come to a small intermission, which is how DisplayLink, the corporation who uh, manufactures these things, reacted to the entire uh, stuff. So this was pretty, s uh, this first reverse, reverse engineering steps happened about uh, Exact, almost exactly a year ago, in fact. And uh, for half a year after that, nobody pretty much looked at this stuff until somebody else, uh, Roberto Di Ioris, started writing an XORG driver. And suddenly, uh, DisplayLink started, oh, we're going to release our great open source library, which is called libdlo, and um, which is open source, but has two big shortcomings. The init sequences were, in fact, still encrypted, so there um, were still just big binary blobs which were dumped, dumped to the device. And um, the compression, especially the Huffman-based compression, which is the defining feature, more or less, of these things, was still missing. So uh, at this point, we decided that um, we would have to figure out the Huffman compression by itself, um, or by ourselves, and started to, to have a look at this. I already mentioned the, the run length compression. The, the Huffman compression with something like GSIP uses is, of course, much more efficient for, um, for yeah, picture data instead of... The, the run length compression might actually work quite well for things like desktop images uh, or, or just user interfaces, but as soon as you get pictures or video, the Huffman compression, of course, is much more efficient. Um, one thing which I already mentioned earlier is that there is a 4.5 kilobyte binary blob which is sent with this command, and this command occurs nowhere else, just in the initialization with this blob. And if you leave this command out, the device still works as, as it does otherwise, just compressed data doesn't work anymore. So uh, this is pretty certainly the Huffman table. And... Um, Okay, so looking at this table didn't really yield much results, so we started again by just analyzing data which we sent from the Windows driver. So the two most basic results were that the uh, pixel values aren't encoded themselves, but the difference to the previous pixel. And when you start a new command, the previous pixel is set to black, so uh, to zero. And the second finding was that bit sequence of two zero bits encodes a difference of null. So this is also uh, in Huffman compression, shortest sequences uh, correspond to the most frequent numbers. And of course, uh, in images, as you have uh, pretty much often, you have um, runs of similar colors still. A zero is uh, the, most, the most common difference value. Um, now, the next step was to just treat this as another crypto problem and find the table again, which gives you the, the Huffman sequence for a certain pixel value or rather difference value. And so we just 
tried uh, basically a chosen plain text attack, which, which means we just send a suitable color pa pattern through the driver, through the Windows driver, um, for every difference value which, which might occur in the data. Uh, for, as the device separates into 16 and 8-bit uh, commands, uh, th and th those are co treated completely separately, uh, the main problem is just to find these uh, two to the power of 16 different difference values. And this isn't that much, in fact, so we just tried a brute force approach here. And now I'll, yeah, now here's the pattern which we uh, used for finding the data. In fact, it was, as a, in, in real, it was a bit more complex, but this serves to illustrate how it actually works. So the background here is black. And this pattern has the color for which we want to find the, the difference value. And so if you go from left to right through the, this um, row, you get the differences of plus n from black to the color, minus n from the color to black, and the same again twice. And below here, you get again a difference value of n. Then we get a difference value of zero because the color stays the same. And at the end, we get a step back to, of minus n uh, to c the color black. And so this is, in fact, pretty easy to find these sequences in the compressed data stream. And OK, yeah. So we try the, the approach is basically to generate this pattern for um, every color n in 16-bit on a back black background, and you get two different bit sequences, as I mentioned. The one starts with 0, 0. Of course, all of them start with 0, 0 as the, um, the first pixel of every row is black, and the starting value is also 0. So we get the sequence for a difference of 0, then we get two pairs of plus and minus n, and the rest is zeros, and we get plus n to zeros minus n. And when we now strip the leading two zeros and try to find the longest uh, repeating substring here, then we end up with the sequence for just plus n minus n. And this now we can compare with this sequence and find the longest common prefix. And when we also have th found this, then we get the two separate se sequences, plus n and minus n. Uh, one sort of sanity check which uh, can be done here is that the two sequences should al al always be of the same length because um, the difference is equally likely to occur in positive direction as well in negative direction. Uh, we assume that this the, the company actually analyzed images and uh, try to find um, yeah, a universally suitable Huffman code which uh, covers a, a wide range of different images like, for example, video images, desktop backgrounds, um, window decorations, and so on. And in such a wide sample of images, it should always, you should always have the same sequence of color, uh, the same uh, probability for each of those sequences. Okay, so in fact this turned out to be easier than we thought. We automated this with a bit of shell scripting. So we had a script running in the virtual machine which simply set, set a new desktop background after some seconds. This would generate uh, data sent by the driver to the device and uh, captured by USB mod. And that in, in order for this to be a bit faster, we just put 32 different color values in every one of those images. So 32 patterns of the sort which you saw earlier. Um, and the total running time was about four hours. This, didn't, this yielded most of the patterns, so not all of them, because um, the method doesn't work when the pattern itself is split at the boundary between two commands. If you remember, uh, every command can only generate up to 256 pixels. And depending on where the command boundary uh, is, it might 
just split the pattern apart and then of course the string analysis doesn't work. So what we did for these values which we, we couldn't capture, we just shifted the pattern by some pixels and repeated the process and by doing this we also got the rest of, of uh, the missing patterns. So it looks like some, some weeks ago somebody found um, um, erroneous sequence, so it may be that there are still some, some sequences which escaped our, our attempts. Okay, now I'll, I'm almost at the end already, and, um, but I'll come to one interesting piece before I finish. So we have still two things which are unsolved and which I would like to invite you to also maybe give a look if you want to. So the, the first one is pretty trivial. This is that we don't have the Huffman sequences for the 8-bit mode yet. So this should be yeah, rather trivial because you just have to repeat the process with, eight -bit dif uh, with colors which uh, differ in the last 8 bits. Uh, the important part, however, is the compressed Huffman table. So we have a, the, the Huffman table is a binary tree which has up to 30 levels, so the longest bit sequences are 30 bits, and there are two uh, to the power of 16 leaf values, all of the difference values, and this entire tree is obviously somehow represented in the 4.5 kilobyte table which is sent to the device. And this, so the tree doesn't seem to have any obvious structure, but uh, somehow it's still represented in there. So, yeah, here we have some sample entries. Uh, the structure seems to look like we have 512 records, each of which has nine bytes. Um, this is particularly evident in the last uh, maybe 135 or so entries, which look like they are empty, uh, and they all have this structure. And um, here's also s some sample entries which look like they correspond to these two uh, leaf node values. So they have, both of them have a bit depth or a bit length for the code of six bits, so these are pretty uh, um, often occurring differences, and you can see, for example, this is 2113, this is 2081, and it m looks like this record somehow contains pointers to the leaf values, and these maybe contain the bit depth, but exactly how these are interrelated, we haven't yet figured out. So this is, um, of course, not strictly necessary to operate the device because um, we do know the Huffman table, we can keep it in memory, it's just about around 320 um, kilobytes. However, for a driver, for example, for a kernel driver, it would still be nice to have um, the compressed version, which is uncompressed on the fly. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> so yeah, I'm already at the end of my talk. <laughs> bit faster than expected. So I'd like to thank some people, of, first of all Roberto Dioris, Markus Glocker, Sven Killig and other people who were actually brave enough to use this stuff on their display length devices and write kernel drivers, for example, for FreeBSD, for Xorg or a terminal emulator. Display Link, uh, in fact, started after at some point started donating devices to us, though they, so they also deserve a thank you. Um, their acceptance of the open source stuff is still somewhat grudging, but uh, I think they have realized that it's here to stay. Um, also, many thanks to my co-author Chris Hodges, and yeah, to you for your attention. Thanks. <laughs> Um, as we still have quite a lot of time, are there any questions? Right. I would ask anyone who has a question to line up on the microphone back there, please. Mm. Hi there. Um, being slightly dumb, I didn't get the idea of the Huffman table. You said there's 4.5K and this gets sent by the driver to the device. Exactly. So this is, yeah, four, four and a half K. Mm -hmm. And uh, it somehow, can, so this Huffman table can be obviously 
uh, sent dynamically by the driver. It's always the same, but they have the option to set a dynamic one, and it somehow contains the instructions for the device on how to decode the Huffman values again into raw binary data. And yeah. So um, first thing, illegally, you could probably nick this binary blob and send it, purely for testing purposes, send, it, send the one you'd nick from the Windows driver and send that down there. But obviously, I guess to encode the data, you need to know how to use the table bit your uncompressed one well, or their 4.5K yeah. one. Well, yes and no. So we or actually do send this table. So it's actually just as a binary blob included in the driver. But we still do need to know the 320K plane mapping from, uh, from differences to values because the table uh, at this moment, this, this small table can just be interpreted by the device and by nothing else. And the big table just is a big a big binary blob coming along with the driver at the moment, which um, yeah, is used in the software to compress data, and the small table is used just on the device to decompress again. But of course, there's a connection between these two. Right, yeah, um, thanks. That's uh, cleared it up a little bit for me. Okay, <laughs> Thank you. you're welcome. Um, a question regarding the tables. Um, because you, maybe you can take the difference. So maybe you have a Windows driver, you make a blue picture, and then you take the, um, the original table, and then you, you, you try with a table you make up and so, see, no, it's not blue, and then you try as long as you get a blue picture. Um, but the Windows driver doesn't change the table, unfortunately. It always uses the same one. So okay, so, so the Windows driver uses the compressed table and knows how to use it. And so you need a table where you know how to use the, the, the compressed table. And you do not know how to get uh, the, um, the original table from the compressed table. So exactly. try, try every table that are possible and compare oh. them with the compressed table. Well, um, I So, I so you, you make a table and you put a picture that should be blue and that is not blue. So you say it's the wrong table. Take the next one. And then you, you have to try and try and try and try and try. That and then you maybe get the right, right table. That would work, but you have, would have to try every, I think, every binary tree which has a depth of at least 30. So these are very, very many trees. I, uh, uh, have you I, calculated I, the efforts? Hmm? How, what, what, what is the, the effort, the cost of the algorithm? Have you calculated it? Uh, no, not yet. Well, it, it, it might be doable. I, I, th I just thought that this is unfeasible for brute force, but um, maybe you're right. Well, so take a logic analyzer and, 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 and detect the DVI signal and see, okay, it's a blue. Ah, okay. It's okay. a green, it's a red, and then you try, and then it triggers on red and says, book, that's red. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, that might be an idea, in fact. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was wondering, uh, Display link started on their own open source driver. You all, you were already working on that. Yes. Um, right now you're trying to crack the last bits. It seems like Display Link isn't against having an open source driver, and it seems that you are willing to write it for them. Um, um, is it? Did you try to contact the developers and, for example, ask them about the compressed Huffman table and the? Well, yes, I did, but there wasn't any real reaction. So it, it looks like they are considering the, the compression or maybe even the, the compression of the table itself their main achievement. And so they're still very quiet on this. And they're also not, it doesn't look like they would like to integrate this into their own driver. So um, yeah, they're, somewhere between helpful and very quiet. They're not really obstructing anything, but they're not, yeah, not quite convinced, obviously. <laughs> uh, one question about the binary driver that you, uh, sorry, the binary table that you have mm -hmm. to send over to get it to work, assuming you are able to write a driver that really does the compression on the computer side, but you don't know how the small table does the decompression on the device. Exactly. Would you even be able to include this into any kernel that has a strict philosophy about 
having non-free binary blobs of firmware? Uh, that's, I, I think that's not a question for me to answer because I'm definitely not an expert in that direction. I suppose that, the, well, it's not really a firmware, so, yeah, I don't know. Okay, okay but maybe I should rephrase it and ask, was that a motivation for you to try and understand how you can fit the complete Huffman table into only four kilobytes? Well, yes, definitely, because then you would also be able to, to actually generate a new table. Uh, for example, if you know that you are going to uh, play a, a certain kind of video, then you might actually generate an optimized table for this video. Um, so maybe you could even extract it somehow from, from MPEG data or something like this. So this would definitely still be interesting. And it would, of course, uh, clear up the licensing, licensing issue because then everything would be free in this driver. Right, I see there are no more questions. One There's more. another one, would you please? Oh, I'll get it for you. <laughs> we'll make an exception. So uh, you mentioned that the Windows driver has this LibUSB static link to their mm -hmm. obviously unsourced driver. Yes. Uh, have you considered contacting the Software Freedom Law Center that they might uh, push them using this information into an agreement that they would release this uh, Huffman table oh. thingy and uh, uh, they wouldn't be sued for that little Libby USB incident? Well, uh, no, we, we didn't do this. I, I thought about it briefly, but I think, yeah, it's, I, well, I, I spoken bluntly, I didn't want to piss them off because they were rather help, a little bit more on the helpful side of things so I thought it would be nasty to, to try and pull out the lawyers and I'm not quite sure if, it, if it's actually a violation of the license if they do this so if you know anything more specific about this I, I'd be curious to hear about this but I, yeah uh, so, so far I, I didn't consider it necessary basically. Right, we're at the end then. Thanks again to the speaker.